4. Simo Haya In the 1900s, one of the world's deadliest snipers was a Finnish man named Simo Haya. During the Winter War, sometimes known as the First Soviet Finnish War, Simo had as many as 505 confirmed kills. His successful career as a military sniper earned him the nickname The White Death, and he was well known among his enemies. Simo was born on December 17, 1905 in the Vipuri province located in southern Finland. His father was a farmer, and he taught his sons everything he knew, so from a young age Simo understood the definition of hard work. He was also an expert hunter and was an avid skier before entering military service at the age of 17. Simo was so skilled with a gun that he won several shooting competitions, and his home was reportedly filled with trophies that praised him for his marksmanship. He wasn't a fan of the spotlight growing up, but his success later in life basically forced him to take center stage. After all, he really was an incredible sniper. Simo's military career began when he joined the Finnish Civil Guard, which was a voluntary militia. Then, in 1925, at 19 years old, he started his 15-month compulsory military service in the urban locality of Rivola. He was first designated to the Bicycle Battalion 2, but after attending the non-commissioned officer school, he was transferred to the Bicycle Battalion 1, where he served as a conscript officer. Amazingly, Simo didn't receive formal sniper training until the year before the Winter War, in 1938. Simo was 33 when the war broke out on November 30, 1939, and his 34th birthday was celebrated on the battlefield. Just three months after the Second World War began, the Soviets invaded Finland. The Winter War only lasted 105 days altogether, but for the first 98 days of battle, Simo unleashed terror on his opponents. His rampage was only halted when he was wounded and had to be hospitalized during the final days of the conflict. However, while he was in action, Simo was virtually unheard and unseen by the enemy. It's believed that one day during the war, he killed as many as 25 men without his position ever being discovered. His talent was so incredible that word of his sniping abilities even reached the Russian front lines. He was able to take out Russian soldiers with such deadly accuracy that he came to be known as the White Death. Simo's shooting skill was in part due to his extensive preparations. He would visit some of his favorite firing positions during the night and would make whatever improvements he felt were necessary. Simo would also clean his gun much more often than other soldiers, and before and after he completed a mission, he would perform maintenance operations on his firearm. During the Winter War, temperatures could get down to minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit, and Simo understood that he had to maintain proper gun maintenance if he wanted to avoid it getting jammed. What's even more impressive is that Simo's gun didn't even have a telescopic sight. His weapon of choice was an M2830, a firearm he'd owned before he joined the military. The rifle would have been a fairly basic gun to any other soldier, but it was the one that Simo had mastered completely through his many years of experience. The sights of his M2830 was adjusted for 492 feet, and this allowed Simo to make rapid adjustments as needed. The man absolutely devastated the battlefield for nearly 100 days, but he was wounded on the 98th day of the war when he was hit by a Russian explosive bullet. The attack left him in a coma, and he didn't regain consciousness until a week later, and by then, the war was over. His injuries resulted in long-lasting facial scarring which left him in near-constant pain for several years afterwards. He returned home to his family's farm following the Winter War, where news of his extraordinary actions made him something of a celebrity. However, as we mentioned earlier, Simo wasn't one to enjoy the spotlight. He instead preferred his own company. A friend of the sniper, Kalevi Ikonen, once said in an interview that Simo spoke more to the animals in the forest than he did with other people. After undergoing 26 surgical operations on his jaw, Simo's speech was never restored fully, so it's not hard to understand that he didn't feel interacting with others was necessary. In 2001, Simo moved into the Kimi Institute for Disabled Veterans, where he passed away the following year at 96 years old. He died an absolute legend, with more than 500 confirmed kills during his time serving in the military. And to this day, he's still arguably the most successful sniper that ever lived. 3. Ivan Mikhailovich Sidorenko it's not entirely uncommon for an artist to turn in their paintbrushes and pencils for bullets and a rifle, 
After all, it's exactly what Adolf Hitler did. And another man who followed in his footsteps was a Russian man named Ivan Mikhailovich Sodorenko. The former art student went on to kill a great number of enemies, most of which were under Hitler's command. During his time serving in World War II, Ivan, a self-taught sharpshooter, took out a whopping 500 enemy troops all by himself, a feat that has only ever been accomplished before by Simo Haya, the legendary sniper that dominated the Winter War in 1939. However, the two men were very different from one another. Ivan was born on September 12, 1919 to a peasant family living in Russia's Glinkovsky district in the city of Smolensk. He completed 10 grades of school before he went on to study at the Penza Art College in southeast Moscow. Then, in 1939, he decided to drop out of college and give up his dreams of becoming an artist and subsequently joined the Red Army. This year marked the beginning of the Second World War, and he was trained as a soldier at the Simferopol Military Infantry School located in the Crimean Peninsula. Ivan first served in the Battle of Moscow in 1941, where he spent a lot of his downtime teaching himself how to be an expert sniper. He found he had a knack for marksmanship, and he quickly rose above the rest of his fellow soldiers. He was very successful in his hunts for enemy troops, which prompted his commanders to ask him to train others. Not too long after, Ivan had a small group of skilled snipers that he would take out on combat missions against the Germans. His kill count was off the charts, and this earned him a promotion to assistant commander of the 1122nd Rifle Regiment headquarters. He used the Mosin Nagan rifle, which was a standard issue firearm for most Soviet troops, but in Ivan's hands, it was a weapon of mass destruction. The gun was typically accurate up to 1,650 feet, but Ivan utilized a telescopic sight, which increased his range to 2,625 feet, almost half a mile. Since Ivan never received any formal sniper training, he relied on his own intuition and instincts, as well as his uncanny ability to put shots on target. Ivan soon made a name for himself throughout the war-torn streets of Moscow, racking up kill after kill. He was known for sniping unsuspecting German soldiers without detection, disappearing like a ghost even after his job was done. Ivan not only went after enemy troops, he also targeted German tanks and supply vehicles, which he would take out using explosive rounds. With Ivan's new position as assistant commander, he fought as a member of the 1st Baltic Front, but as the war progressed, he transitioned into more of a training role for snipers and spent less time in combat himself. However, on occasion he would still venture out to the front lines in order to take out German troops. Ivan was wounded several times during his time serving on the front, but in Estonia in 1944, he was severely injured, bringing his sniper career to an end. For the rest of World War II, Ivan spent his days recovering in a hospital. By the time his military service was finished, he racked up 500 kills, and he trained 250 men to follow in his footsteps. In June of that same year, he was awarded the gold medal of the Hero of the Soviet Union. Ivan has since been credited as the most successful Russian sniper of World War II. After leaving the army, Ivan took a job in Chelyabinsk Oblast as a foreman of a coal mine. In 1974, he moved to the Caucasus and lived the rest of his life in the Republic of Dagestan, where he died on February 19, 1994. If you were a sniper during wartime, would you rather set up your position in a tall tree or on the roof of a building? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. 2. Carlos Hathcock Carlos Hathcock was born on May 20, 1942 in Little Rock, Arkansas, but he grew up in the city of Wynn. For the first 12 years of his life, he lived with his grandma as his parents had separated before he was born. He taught himself how to shoot as a young boy, taking on hunting at an early age as a way to feed his poor family. His whole life, Carlos dreamed of being a Marine. And so, in 1959, he enlisted at just 17 years old. By then, he was already a skilled sharpshooter, and he went on to win the Wimbledon Cup Shooting Championship in 1965. The following year, Carlos would be deployed to Vietnam, where he changed the face of American warfare forever. Carlos was initially deployed as a military policeman, but he immediately volunteered for combat. Not long after, he was transferred to the 1st Marine Division Sniper Platoon, which was stationed in Da Nang, Vietnam. This was where Carlos would earn his nickname, White Feather. Apparently, the marksman would always wear a white feather on his bush hat 
as if he was daring the Vietnamese to find him. He would also come to be known as the deadliest sniper in the Vietnam War. It's estimated that Carlos had as many as 393 kills throughout his time as a sniper. He was made for this type of work, and his commanding officer said that he had the drive, patience, and courage for the job. The longest shot he's credited for making was from 7,380 feet away, a distance of just under half a mile. In 1969, Carlos was riding in a military vehicle that hit a landmine, consequently knocking several of his fellow Marines unconscious. In the aftermath of the incident, it's been reported that Carlos pulled seven men from the burning wreckage. He was truly an American hero, and when he finally got out of Vietnam, over 40% of his body was covered in burns. The explosion from the mine ended his sniping career, but he went on to establish the Marine Sniper School in Quantico, Virginia. In 1996, Carlos received the Silver Star for saving so many of his Marine brothers in 1969. Unfortunately, this action caused him to suffer from multiple sclerosis later in life, and he died at the age of 56 in Virginia Beach in February of 1999. 1. Deadly German Snipers A pair of German snipers left a trail of chaos and death in their wake, and their names were Matthaus Hetzenauer and Josef Alaberga. The men grew up in very similar circumstances, and they were both born in Austria in December of 1924. Josef came from the town of Vorsiesenheim, which is near the city of Salzburg, and Matthaus was from the village of Brixen in Tal. Over the course of their time in the military, Matthaus and Josef would go to serve together on the Eastern Front. Between the two of them, their kill count was over 600, and they absolutely devastated the Soviet soldiers over the course of two years. Josef was originally sent to the brutal Eastern Front as a machine gunner, but after he was injured in Stavropol, which had been captured by the Germans in 1943, he underwent a changing career with the military. While he was recovering from his wounds, Josef began practicing with a Soviet Mosin Nagat rifle, which had been captured from the enemy. He grew fond of the weapon, and in no time he'd made 27 kills using the firearm. This is when he was sent to Siedtala Alpen to undergo formal sniper training. While going through training, Josef was given a Karabiner 98K firearm with a 4 times telescopic sight, a gun that was used by many sharpshooters due to its extreme accuracy. But he would often opt to use a Gower 43 with a 4 times sight or an MP40 submachine gun instead. In order to stay hidden from the enemy, he would often find a decent place to shoot and then would use something called the Varmeg technique. This technique involves using an umbrella with the cloth removed and replaced by foliage that would be interwoven into its frame. Josef would hold the camouflaged umbrella in front of his body to stay out of sight. Josef never fired at a target that had not been identified, and he only ever shot one bullet from each of his positions. This was the mantra he lived by, and it proved to be successful as he safely made it to the end of the war in one piece. He was awarded the Iron Cross, the Sniper's Badge, and an Infantry Assault Badge following the war. Then, for the injury he suffered in Stavropol, he was also given the Wound Badge. Matthaus joined the military in 1943, and the following year he trained as a sniper at Siedala Alpen. He was then transferred to the 3rd Gebergs Jäger Division as a Gefrita. The weapons he used were the Gower 43 and the Karabiner 98K sniper variant, the same guns Josef used during his training. Matthaus, now an expert sniper, saw action in Slovakia, Hungary, and the Carpathians. However, in November 1944, he suffered a head injury after getting caught in some crossfire. Matthaus was responsible for a total of 345 enemy deaths during his time as a German sniper, and his longest confirmed kill was from an astounding 3,609 feet away. This was an accomplishment that only the highest skilled snipers could pull off. Matthaus was awarded with the highest honor in 1945, the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Unfortunately, the next month in May of that year, he was captured by the Soviets and he spent five years of his life as a prisoner of war. Matthaus passed away in October of 2004, six years before his fellow sniper Josef, who had returned to his hometown following his military service to work as a carpenter. Which of these wartime snipers impressed you the most? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye!